Welcome to Primity, where we find simple techniques to help address modern problems for our primitive bodies. My name is Andrew Pafford, and I'm a health and wellness professional with over a decade of experience helping Olympic athletes, desk jockeys, and seniors achieving their goals and improving their quality of life. Our purpose with Primity is to distill results of scientific findings into easily approachable strategies and techniques to improve health and wellness for everyday life. We let you, the people, decide what you need help with the most, and here's who we've got today. Elizabeth P. asks, how can I make my desk job less detrimental to my health? Wow, that is a big <laughs> undertaking, to say the least. Um, there's actually a number of different ways that sitting is bad, and what we'll do is we'll actually kind of encompass this a little bit more, and not just to say sitting, but we'll say holding a posture for an extended period of time. Because I think one of the devil in the details is sitting in and of itself gets the worst rap because that's what the vast majority of our culture does when the reality is it's not necessarily the position of sitting that is awful it's staying in that position for a very long period of time just like staying on your feet for a very long period of time can be detrimental to certain aspects of your health so don't think of the act of sitting down as being bad if you do it for a short period of time, it's quite restful. It's how we gather our energy back. When you're tired, you want to take a load off your feet. You sit down. You kick your feet up, right? It's do you stay in that position for an extended period of time? That's where things can start to happen. So there's a number of different factors that can happen. It can actually affect your metabolism, your endocrine system, or the um, thing that makes your hormones, so it even changes you on a hormonal level because it's essentially the lack of activity. But being a musculoskeletal guy, the thing that I can speak to the most of why sitting is so bad and for my particular expertise is actually how it plays one of our systems against us, and that's called human resting muscle tone, or HRMT for short. The purpose of HRMT is so our bodies can help us without having to think about it. We use HRMT daily, and most of these, if you want to call them routines or muscle patterns, are ingrained to the point that we don't have to think about it. We've effectively trained our bodies to do things. And it's so subtle and subconscious that we just take it for granted because we don't realize that it's happening all the time. As you sit or as you stand, there are number of muscles firing and engaging in order to help you hold that position. I'm sure most of you know by now that we're actually horrible at multitasking. So we're very one track minded in doing things. So if you're having to, let's say, look at your computer screen to do work, you're not thinking about your trunk having to have some level of activation to hold yourself up in your chair so you don't just all of a sudden slide off and fall out of the side of your chair. Or you're not thinking about all of the neck muscles holding your head up as you look at your computer screen. If you want a, a good example of something that doesn't have HRMT or a or should I say programmed HRMT, think about a newborn learning to lift their head. It's almost like they're drunk, right? So they hold the head up. It's like moving all over the place. They're struggling to keep it there, not just because the muscles are weak, but because there is no program for it to have learned to hold the head steady. So they're having to focus on just holding the head straight, let alone trying to fixate on an object, right? So imagine having to think about controlling your feet, controlling your trunk, controlling your neck, controlling your gaze all at once while trying to accomplish whatever the task at hand is on your computer screen. So HRMT does all this for us. And the reason I bring that up is because we program HRMT with how we use our bodies. Our bodies learn by doing in terms of a physical aspect. So we call this sort of a neuromuscular training where the nerve muscle connection happens. Think of it like practice. The more we practice at something, the more we start to make the connections and synapses and fine tune it so that way we get better at throwing, better at running, better at jumping. We also get better at posture as well. 
So the more I assume a position, the more my body will actually learn to basically keep assuming that position. And so that's effectively what we are doing is we're hijacking HRMT and we're making it work against us. So when we sit for a long period of time, what ends up happening is we start to over demand and even you could, I guess you could use the term over shorten certain muscles while under utilize or over lengthen other muscles. The body is very unique in that it has a lot of redundancies or we call them push-pull mechanisms. In this case for muscularity we have a lot of antagonists or things that work against each other. So for every bicep you have a tricep. One bends the elbow, one straightens the elbow. For every quad you have a hamstring. Quads straighten the knee, hamstrings bend the knee for the most part. So things move in opposition or they work against each other. So what ends up happening is when we stay in one position, one one group or one side of the fence is typically left in a shortened position while the other side of the fence is left in a elongated position. Well, muscles that are shorter are easier to activate and muscles that are lengthened are harder to activate. It's almost like an off switch. So for this particular example, we'll talk about your glutes and your hip flexors. Your glutes, your butt, as you sit on them, and as you are in a what we call a hip flexed position or my knees are basically brought up in front of my body, this is lengthening your glutes. So because I'm sitting on them, which makes it harder to activate, and I'm lengthening them, which also makes it harder to activate, the act of sitting is doing a good job of essentially deadening activation in my glutes. And so if you don't use it, you lose it. So now it becomes much harder to activate your glutes when you then hop up or go to do other things that are not sitting. On the flip side of the coin, because I'm seated in that hip flexed position or with my knees up in front of me at sort of that 90 degrees, my hip flexors are now left in a shortened position. So this is where now the HRMT starts to come in. By staying in that position, I'm actually using my hip flexors to also hold my body upright. Most people don't realize, but the majority of your hip flexors actually originate on the side of your lumbar spine. So your low back on the sides of the spine, and it actually runs down the back of your abdominal wall. So we're talking specifically about your psoas, major for those of you anatomy buffs. So the psoas or that major hip flexor starts at the low back and then runs basically through arguably kind of close to your um, inguinal or your groin area and then it wraps around and hooks onto the back of your femur or your thigh bone high up near your hip and that's what gives it that ability to pull the leg so it uses your trunk as a base to pull the leg up we call this an open chain movement well closed chain movement does the opposite where if my limbs are fixed i can now pull my trunk up so when you're sitting on a chair but it has no back, you're predominantly using your hip flexors to help hold yourself upright. So those muscles are on for an extended period of time. So if you're sitting in your chair and you're slouching, they may be in a shortened position but probably not activated. But what will happen is you might get uncomfortable in that position so you'll naturally engage and sit up. And by doing that, you're using those hip flexors. So the likelihood of you using your hip flexors throughout the day is drastically increased. Meanwhile, their antagonists or the muscle group that's supposed to even them out, their glutes, are left long and left off. So then when you stand up, what happens is those muscles just got trained for eight hours at your desk to stay in that shortened position and stay on. So all of a sudden you pop up where you're now needing to lengthen them out. They're not wanting to because they want to stay short and they want to stay on. So what ends up happening is it actually pulls that spine, that low back forward. Or now what we call this an anterior tipped pelvis. So if you imagine your belt around your body, if the front of your belt 
where the buckle is is lower than the back of your belt which is um, right at your sacrum or right at the uh, small of your back so if the back of your belt is higher than the front of your belt this is called an anterior tipped position this is not good because now you have a lot of pressure being dumped onto your lumbar spine or your low back so this is a huge indicator or a huge cause of a lot of low back issues is from just sitting all the time so one of the big targets to then go after is all right well if we figured out this culprit particular for this low back problem how do we go about addressing it well first and foremost we have one group that is long and off and we have the opposing group that is short and overactivated so we have to turn off the one that's overactive and we have to then work to turn on the one that is off so we need to basically try to engage the glutes and get those going while simultaneously either creating some length or helping to disengage the hip flexors that is a lot easier said than done i assure you but what we're trying to do is to distill and point out the fact that when you are trying to overcome something it's never just a one-shot approach there's usually no magic bullet and to top it off everyone is a little bit unique some people might be born with say um, either sciatica like true true sciatica where the nerve itself is running through the muscle or they might have scoliosis where their spine might be a little bit cockeyed so there could be a lot of compounding factors so before trying to just jump into something should always first and foremost consult with your doctor and make sure that you've looked at everything but with musculoskeletal issues usually is things are out of balance and it's just a matter of redressing the balance so in this particular instance for this one case study that applies to probably a lot of people but also applies to no one as well because they have many other factors going on at the same time but something that's a worth a worthwhile place to start if you have low back pain and you know you have a job that requires lots of sitting is to go after the tight muscles so using self-massage or smr self myofascial release trigger point roughing whatever you want to call it whatever your preferred method of getting overactive muscles to disengage and then once you can get that into a position where it feels like it's off and it's not tight and angry at you then performing hip flexor stretches so one that you can look up on youtube very easy is called the samson lunge s-a-m-s-o-n lunge so it's just a kneeling hip it's a um, half kneeling hip flexor stretch essentially there are right and wrong ways to do that you can compound your low back problem by doing a samson lunge incorrectly so make sure you've watched a couple videos and i will hopefully in the future work to have some sort of archive where i would say that they are um, politically correct exercises if you will but making taking care that you're feeling the stretch where you should which is in the hip flexor or basically you'll perceive it in the front in the groin area not in your low back if whenever you do these exercises if it's exacerbating the problem chances are it's not correct and you need to stop doing that motion um, so that would be how to disengage and lengthen your short and overactive muscle now going to the underactive over lengthened muscle we now need to engage and shorten which typically you're doing while engaging you're contracting the muscle so you're shortening it in this case a concentric muscle or concentric um, contraction so anything and everything that is all good for glutes the caveat is that once off a lot of glute exercises can be hijacked and what i mean is that the body is very clever in that muscles don't just perform a lot of muscles don't just perform one function they actually have secondary and even tertiary functions as well so in the instance of the glutes your hamstrings can also act as hip extenders which is the primary job of the glutes so if someone has very weak glutes but has adapted with their hamstrings they can perform a lot of hip extension movements without ever adequately utilizing the glutes which is now a whole nother can of worms 
because you can be overcompensating, overworking the hamstrings and creating issues there all the while thinking, well, I'm doing all these exercises that are supposed to be glute intensive, so I should be fine. My glutes are probably fine when the reality is, no, you're just compensating very well, but one day the straw will break the poor camel's back and now you'll have to deal with bad hamstrings and no glutes. So a good place to start for an a isolatory glute motion, so trying to do a motion that only the glutes can execute. So if they can't do it, nothing happens. And that's sort of the old building vol, here's your sign of, yeah, you can do all these other things, but if you can't do this isolatory motion that is spe glute specific, then chances are you've been compensating and not using your glutes at all. Um, so a good one to look into is what's called the Cook Bridge. So Gray Cook, the um, coined the father of functional fitness, basically helps develop a movement that isolates so you can get a a, a, a one-sided glute um, bridge and you're put in a position so your hamstrings can't help even the neighboring glute can't help and if you struggle to do a glute a, a, a cook bridge then that is a big big red flag that your glutes are off weak not activated whatever you want to call it asleep at the wheel and that that's where you need to start your journey. Um, once, if you can do a cook bridge, and again, you can just YouTube it, C-O-O-K bridge, cook bridge. If you can get one with Gray Cook actually showing you, that's the ideal. Um, but if you can do a cook bridge, but it's difficult to perform, or it feels like you are not, you're able to execute it, but you can't actually feel the muscle like contract hard doing cook bridges even if you are capable of perceiving that glute activation is still a good what we call a primer or kind of waking it up once you've gotten the cook bridge once you've gotten the glutes primed and quote unquote awake you can feel them you can activate them you know that they're not going to rely on others to compensate now you have a perception to go with so now moving into more classical glute exercises which are usually quote-unquote integrative where they're using other muscle groups but the glutes should be doing the majority of the work so single-legged rdls or romanian deadlifts or if you want to be i guess politically correct straight-legged deadlifts standing on one leg so if i'm standing on my left leg my right foot is off the ground and i'm holding a weight in my right hand and then slowly hinging at the left hip only. Again, YouTube videos to help see a couple different iterations of how to do a single-legged RDL. Um, doing heel drops are fantastic. I'm a huge fan of doing asymmetrical or single-limb loaded movements, especially when it comes to hips and glutes, because there's a lot of compensation, a lot of dominance, so people typically prefer one side over the other. So you might find that you're able to execute very well on one side, and the other side is very shaky, especially if you have a history of playing some sort of sport that involved kicking. You may have had a very strong plant leg because that was the leg that you would stand on when you would then use your likely your dominant leg to kick. So for instance, I'm a righty. I would stand on my left leg so I could kick with my right. My balance and therefore my left glutes are much stronger on my left side. Even though I'm aware of it and I'm working to train it, it's also natural to have a, dis a discrepancy of arguably 5 to 10 pounds between left and right side depending on what uh, joint you're comparing to the from left and right side. That is normal. Having a disparity of about 20 pounds or more is not normal and that's a big red flag of something that you need to get back into balance. So I'm a huge fan of doing the asymmetrically loaded or doing one side and then the other side movements as opposed to doing a normal deadlift where both of your feet are on the ground and you should be utilizing the hips as a unit all at once. So starting out with the asymmetrically loaded exercises first to make sure that you don't have any imbalances because no one wants to do a conventional deadlift with their hips shooting out to the side because only one of your hips is doing the work. Now you're overloading it, you're having huge postural problems in the process. <clears throat> so doing the asymmetrically loaded movements first, 
making sure that there's not huge disparities. Also, it's always great to get some balance control in because we, most people are lacking in balance anyways, so that's always a fun little wake-up call. And once you've found that you can do those with some adequate weight, then you sort of checked off and given yourself some room to say, okay, now we can start talking about doing heavy squats, deadlifts, hip thrusts, sort of your more uh, lun- uh, normal lunges, some more of your, your more traditional exercises that you can load up, continue to strengthen the glutes. So in this particular instance, working to reverse HRMT if being left in those positions is what's, in the, for this particular case, causing the short hip flexors and weak glutes, I need to spend time doing the opposite to counter some of my HRMT programming. So if I just spend a bunch of time shortening and tightening my hip flexors and lengthening and weakening my glutes, I need to make sure I'm spending time relaxing and lengthening my hip flexors while also contracting and strengthening my glutes to help counter a lot of that sitting. And usually with joint problems, we always perceive it not necessarily at the level that it occurs. So in that instance, talking about, say, low back pain. Just because you have a low back problem doesn't mean you have a low back problem. You may have low back symptoms, but you might actually have weak hips. So one of the things, uh, one of the mantras that we would usually follow in training is anytime you have a problem spot, always look above and below. So let's say someone has a knee problem. Nine times out of 10, if it is a, if it is a non-acute injury, meaning I didn't just see you like blow your AC all out because someone tackled you from the side. So if you've just been training normal, training normal, and your knees are slowly starting to get angry at you for no discernible reason, nine times out of 10, that's not a knee problem. (laughs) Usually it's something that controls the knee and it's just taking it out on the knee. So if I have a knee problem, I'm going to look above the knee. So I'm looking at the quads and the thigh and the hamstrings, so the muscles in your thigh. And I'm even going to look below, so looking at the calves and even the ankle itself. So if I have a runner who has a knee problem, if they have very tight ankles, there's no shock absorption going on at the first point of contact. So the knee is taking the majority of the the force and now they're having knee problems because they have an ankle that's not working so if i just continue to treat the symptoms i'm never fixing the problem right so going back to the question with the sitting is if i'm always just trying to appease my low back and getting low back massages i'm never fixing the actual problem which is the weak hips and the overactive hip flexors that are pulling myself out of that ideal posture and wreaking havoc on my low back. So that is how to take an active approach for training to kind of help circumvent certain things. And you can take this philosophy and apply it to other parts of the bad postures that you can get from sitting too much. So if I am sitting in my desk and I'm craning my neck so my head is coming forward, and now I have got this like quasi-moto, we call this a kyphotic curve where the head is very forward. A normal posture, your ears should be over your shoulders. So if my ears are well about like two to three inches forward of my shoulders, you know, it doesn't look attractive because it's not good for your neck. So now you're creating neck issues. So if I'm spending time with this forward head, then I have to address that by spending time with my head back. So actually devising a a wave to almost like if you were lying in your bed taking pillows having obviously there's the pillow that we all like to sleep on but having something that allows the head to rest back a little bit more and it may not be comfortable at first depending on how bad your posture is and how long it's taking you to get into that that kyphosis or that upper cross syndrome so spending more time to try to again reverse engineer that hrmt to help pull the head back as well you could also think about with feet too so depending on the chair that you're at if you sit in a chair with your feet under you and your toes are pointed you're leaving your calves in a shortened position 
So for your um, fitness aficionados, we're talking a plantar flexed position, or think of like a ballerina with doing a toe point, right? So if you're sitting and your chair's a little too high, but you like to tuck your feet under your chair to help get more mass under your center of gravity so it's easier to stay upright with good posture. So if your toes are pointed, you're leaving your calves in a shortened position. So over time, this can lead to plantar fasciitis, if you're extremely active, that can cause shortened calves and lots of tension that could cause your Achilles tendon to pop. Um, so now you need you have an overactive tight calf, and its antagonist is a teeny tiny little muscle in the front of your shin called your tibialis anterior. So that little guy is one job, and that's to make sure you don't drag your toes when you're running so that you don't face plant. But your calf muscle is insanely huge and more powerful compared to your poor tib anterior. So you have to do lots and lots of soft tissue work, or as we affectionately call it, mobility work. Lots of soft tissue work to help disengage those tight calves, followed by stretching to then make sure that you're able to add some length. So then when you do go run and you are active, you're not at risk of damaging your Achilles tendon or if you're not active and you just have tight calves all the time that can manifest in plantar fasciitis a lot of people again treating the symptoms not the problem don't realize that plantar fasciitis is so aptly named because it's addressing the plantar fascia or connective tissue in the bottom of your foot so the plantar p-l-a-n-t-a-r the plantar surface is basically the bottom of your foot well, people don't realize that your calves, we all know where our Achilles tendon is right above our heel, right? <clears throat> your Achilles tendon doesn't just attach right above your heel and then just magically disappear. It slowly becomes that plantar tissue, that fascia, that connective tissue that surrounds all the underside of your foot. So what happens is if the calves get really tight, it pulls on the Achilles tendon, which is just a nice, big, thick, tendinous cord so it's designed to put up with some crap so then that pulls continuing on the chain to the plantar fascia which as it spreads out and becomes this just kind of cobwebby substance that's where effectively the weak link in the chain is and so as the tissues start to pull and separate from the bottom of the foot that's what causes that irritate the irritation the swelling and the pain and that's why a lot of people who have plantar fasciitis actually find thing, uh, shoes with like heel lifts more comfortable because you're putting yourself in that shortened calf position. It stops pulling on the Achilles and the Achilles stops pulling on the plantar fascia. And without that pulling, it's not irritated anymore. But the moment you don't have those shoes, you're now quote unquote overstretching the system and now your symptoms return. So people go after the foot and they go after where the pain is and they don't do anything to address the, the calf muscles, the soleus and the gastric memius. If you can get those to shut off and lengthen, they'll stop pulling on the Achilles, which will stop pulling on the plantar fascia, which will start to heal and eventually go away. So taking the concept of addressing your short muscles, doing self-massage work, and stretching in combination to help go after those muscles that are too short and can be pulling things out of whack and then activating the other guys. So in this case, the opposite to your calf would be your tibialis anterior. So just literally pulling your toes up and relaxing, pulling your toes up and relaxing, or I should say lifting your, your foot off the floor. For your anatomy buffs, this is dorsiflexion. So using that muscle in the front of your shin, you do this enough, you'll feel the front of your shin start to get a little fatigued and kind of achy because, yeah, that's exactly what we're going for. The other reason that we emphasize using the antagonists, not only does this help make sure that you're not becoming imbalanced by having weak muscles, so... Tib, anter um, tib anterior for the calf example or glutes for the hip flexors for the hip example but what we're also doing is killing two birds with one stone is we're strengthening a weak muscle but we are also tapping into a reflex in the body called reciprocal inhibition which is a big fancy term for 
we're making sure that the opposing muscle gets out of the way. So if I'm going to, in this example, let's say flex my bicep, right? And I need to pick up something heavy. If I'm going to do a curl to lift something, it would be horribly inefficient if my triceps were activating while I was trying to curl something. Because not only am I trying to curl, say, a 30-pound dumbbell, I'm also having to battle 20 pounds of resting tension that my triceps have. So I'm having to exert 50 pounds of force to lift a 30-pound dumbbell. That would be horribly inefficient. And since our bodies are fantastic machines, we actually have a mechanism to prevent that from happening called reciprocal inhibition. So when you consciously activate, in this case, your biceps to curl something, your triceps will automatically shut off to make sure that they get out of the way. So by working the harder to activate muscles, we're also simultaneously sending off signals to those overly activated shortened muscles. So in the instance of the hips, by doing those glute exercises, we're trying to get into a hip extended position. Activating your glutes helps you disengage your hip flexors because of reciprocal inhibition. By activating my tibialis anterior, I'm helping to disengage my calves through reciprocal inhibition. So now we're starting to balance out the HRMT. So by doing the soft tissue work, we're helping to send off signals. So if I'm doing massage on my calves, I'm helping to send off signals to undo the HRMT. By doing my foot lifts and activating my tibialis anterior, I'm using reciprocal inhibition to send off signals to undo some of that HRMT. So doing some of these activities is a good way to undo some of the sitting. Now, all of that is one active approach. The other approach, which is really the magic bullet, sort of a... <laughs> sort of a setup because there, there really is no magic bullet, but the arguably the best way to not have to worry about spending extra time to do this is to change your position. So if sitting for a long period of time is bad, then we just change our position, right? Well, I gave it away at the very beginning. Every position has a negative, has a downside. Standing for too long has a downside. The sweets, The secret sauce, the sweet spot, is that we are physiologically designed to move. We were always on the move. So primitive times, go way back when, before agriculture, anything, we were constantly on the hunt, constantly moving, trying to find things, working with our hands, you name it. Our bodies were moving just about the entire time that we were awake. So we have basically changed very quickly in the blink of an eye in terms of evolution. So what we need to do is try to continue to emulate that movement. In this case, by changing positions approximately every 10 to 15 minutes, we can mitigate a lot of those issues. So a good metaphor that I like to kind of use is if sitting is the poison, exercise, or in this case, corrective exercise, so doing your cook bridges and whatnot to undo the hip flexor issues is the antidote. Well, as long as you're taking the poison, you need to keep taking the antidote. So as long as I'm continuing to sit for eight straight hours, I have to keep spending time doing glute exercises and doing my soft tissue work and trying to keep myself in balance. So if I get lazy in the gym doing my corrective work, but I'm still sitting, I'm forgetting to take my antidote to counteract my poison. So I'm going to start getting sick again. So I've had lots of clients who tell me, you know, I can really tell that these exercises work and whatnot, but if we go like a week between sessions because they go out on vacation or something or something comes up or they're sick and they're unable to train but they're still working and they're still sitting all the time, they feel like they go backwards. And that's why, as I tell them, you're still taking the poison, you just didn't take your antidote. And so now you're starting to get sick again. So you have to work even hard. You have to take even more antidote to undo the buildup of poison that's been coming. Well, what's the obvious solution? Stop taking the poison. <laughs> now, it's, again, way easier said than done, right? 
but in this metaphor, the idea is if sitting for an extended period of time is the problem, what can you do to not be stuck in a position for an extended period of time? So some people will get a standing desk. It's not the fact that you need to be standing. It's the fact that you need to have the luxury of being able to change positions. So as you mentioned earlier, standing has negatives. You talk to anyone that worked in um, retail and they were on their feet for a, for their career, they have varicose veins as like a plague or spider, uh, spider veins as they're so affectionately named of damaging the veins in your lower limbs, which can have a lot of blood flow problems, um, venous return venous pooling so you get a lot of fluid that gets stuck in the lower quarter because those veins have lost their structural integrity return the blood flow properly so there's negatives to every position so the caveat or the trade-off is as long as you're cycling between positions you're never in one position long enough for the negative effects to build up for that poison to build up so in this instance if i'm seated and then i stand I'm spending some time with my hips in a flexed position, so my glutes are off, my hip flexors are shortened, but then if I stand up for five to 10 minutes, now my hip flexors are lengthened and my glutes are shortened, and then I swap back and forth relatively frequently, I'm creating motion with all the benefits that come with it, but I'm not holding one position, and I'm not allowing HRMT to commandeer my body and now be worked against me so the real silver bullet if possible is to try to cycle between positions as frequently as possible now i know it's hard for archie apologies my miniature labradoodle is being cute and adorable and wanting to get some water come on buddy there you go so if you are cycling between motions you're never stuck in one position so hrmt can't pick in kick in and go okay i need to hold this position because he's telling me or she's telling me they're going to be in this position for a while i need to hold this for them so that they can continue on their work if i'm always cycling positions i'm never sending that signal for my body to say you need to get stuck in this seated position so This could involve different types of chairs. Even if you have just a normal chair and your job is not quite on the up and up in terms of ergonomics or HR, then you can simply adjust the height of your chair because that's going to change your foot position. That's going to change your leg position. It's going to change your gaze. So your head's not going to be at the exact same level all the time. You can be looking down. You can be looking up. So those things right there are going to affect it. Even how you sit, so you can actually sit cross-legged. So now I'm not tightening my hip flexors nearly as much. Now my external hip rotator is in more of a shortened position. Depending on your office decorum, you could even prop your feet up so you're more of a reclined position. You could actually get a footstool to put under your desk so that way you can prop your feet up and kind of slide forward in your chair a little bit. So now as I'm sitting in my on my couch, my feet are on the floor, but if I imagine that they were in a footstool, my hips are not nearly as flexed and I never had to leave my chair. Didn't have to stand up, didn't have to get a new chair, didn't have to invest in a Versa desk, you name it. So there's lots of hacks that you can do with like a footstool, adjusting the height of your chair, um, changing your keyboard and even monitor position, So taking into account your um, gaze and your neck, how close you sit to your computer, how far away you sit from your computer. If you sit terribly close, you might be inclined to now pull your head back. We call this cervical retraction. So this is the opposite of the craning your neck, but kind of pulling your head back or giving, as I say, giving yourself a double chin. So now you're actually spending time trying to reverse that HRMT that's caused that forward head Um, if you find that difficult because there's actually a very small set of muscles basically behind your esophagus on the backside of your throat called your cervical retractors is what pulls your head back to give you that double chin you can kind of give yourself physical cues you can just take a piece of scotch tape pull your head back like you're giving yourself that double chin put the run the tape from your chin 
right down to the top of your sternum. There's that little kind of circle right at your esophagus. Like you always, um, like if um, you follow your throat and you come all the way down until you hit that bone at your collar, so it's right between your two collarbones, you can tape it right there. And if your head starts to drift forward, that tape will pull on your chin or it'll pull right there at the uh, very tippy top of your chest. And that will be your physical reminder that you're letting your head slip forward and that you need to spend more time back again. So there's lots of tricks that you can do there. So in terms of sitting, how do we make sitting not so detrimental in this particular instance for our for musculoskeletal reasons? Number one, try to stop taking the poison. Try to change positions as much as possible. Don't let HRMT hijack you. So sitting, adjusting your chair depth up and down, getting a footstool to allow for different foot positions. If you can get a standing desk, you can get a Swiss ball or yoga ball, whatever you want to call it, this stability ball. They're all the same thing, but just the giant blow up inflatable balls. Those are different, but again, they have their own cons as well. Like uh, you could actually fall off those things and get hurt as opposed to a normal chair, which is a lot harder to fall off of. So uh, nothing is bulletproof. And that's, that's the thing to remember is, but the more options you have, the easier it's going to be to cycle between them. And then getting, again, work appropriate getting some sort of recurring timer if you can set that for 10 to 15 minutes because if you just get in the zone you'll be stuck in your chair and i'm sure some of you can um uh, sympathize you'll be in the zone and for like two hours and even forget to go to the bathroom because you're so focused on your work so unless you have some external force pull you out of your focus like a, an alarm you're going to forget to change positions so getting a recurring alarm, all of these are relatively little to no cost. Again, footstool, adjusting your chair, changing the height of your monitor, getting a recurring alarm, all of these things can help greatly mitigate the poison of sitting too long, if you will. So stop taking the poison to the best of your ability, using those tools to hack that. And then second is take the antidote even if you stop taking the poison you're still sick it's still coursing through your veins even though you've stopped ingesting it the damage has already been done so you need to work to undo that you got to take the antidote so doing your soft tissue work working to disengage whatever your favorite um, method is for that and we can talk that'll be a whole nother episode of talking about soft tissue work um, working to disengage overactive muscles and lengthening them got to do both at the same time otherwise they're not nearly as effective and then working to tackle your weak non-active overly lengthened muscles so like glutes tib anterior your upper back for those of you who have that upper cross syndrome needing to target all of those areas because it's a lot of work just to make a workout program to undo sitting demons essentially it's a whole workout day if you are starting to succumb to those problems. So stop taking the poison and get your antidote. And that would be my two cents for how do I make sitting less detrimental to my health. Hopefully that was useful, and we will tune back next time for episode number two of Primity. Thanks for joining.